Welcome. Uh, I understand it's the end of the session, so I'm going to go through it relatively quickly, but this is not that related to branding. It's more about overall strategy, but I think it'd be really helpful. Um, if you do like what you see, there's an entire book written about it. It's been recommended by like the best business schools in the entire world. Uh, so definitely. I have a PDF. Oh, actually? Illegally? Uh, unfortunately. Thank God. Unfortunately. Thank God. <laughs> we'll cut that up. So Blue Ocean Strategy. I have a couple quotes just to get you started on like the overall idea that this is trying to tackle. And you know, the only way to beat the competition is to stop trying to beat the competition, right? So this is said again by the professor of strategy and management in one of the biggest business schools in the entire world, I think it's in France. Um, in a different perspective, go where the profits and growth are, not where the and where the competition isn't, right? So the, one of the best ways to be successful is to create a market space that doesn't have that competition and or change your product in a way where you're not you know fiercely fighting against the same targeted demographic so let's get some definition well, why is it called oceans what, what's blue ocean so a red ocean because of all the fighting i guess uh is an existing market it has increasing competition they're and they're each battling for the same market segments right so when you have i don't know a big messaging company like WhatsApp, they're competing against, well, well, Viber is more competing against WhatsApp, but they're all competing against the same targeted demographic, right? Because they all have the same feature set, more or less, and they all trying to get the same users. When you look at a blue ocean, it's a newer market, right? You can produce a market segment, you can find those new user bases without having to compete with other people. And compared to the red ocean, demand here is created, right? The pie gets bigger. It's not looking for a bigger segment of the pie at sacrificing somebody else's. So what is the blue ocean strategy? I'm going to go through some of the, the frameworks that I mentioned in the book, but I think like the most powerful way for you to completely understand what the blue ocean strategy is, is to look at an example that I'll cover at the end. So taking a blue ocean approach means your goal isn't to outperform the competition, right? It's not to be the best of, of, of like what's something that's currently happening. Instead, what you aim to do is innovate, you know, provide new value and redraw the industry boundaries, making all the current competition irrelevant. So what the book highlights is four actions. First is get rid of the unnecessary. See what in the market is overvalued ultimately. So what are current companies overvaluing? And through the process of removing that, then you have all these new resources, all this new time that you can allocate into dominating in other areas. So what would be an example? Budget airlines. Previously, before the rise of all these budget airlines, Ryanair, EasyJet happened, all these airlines were competing on all these complementary goods. So a big spend, like a, a big amount of money they were spending went to lounges. So oh, you have to have the American Airlines lounge and that's what differentiates it from a better airline or you have to have the, I don't know, British Airways lounge. And what budget airlines realize is that this product, this feature was being overvalued in the market. And by completely removing it, then they could increase their, their, their profit margins, they could provide more regular flights and they could provide and they could share that decreased cost onto the consumer. And they carved out an entirely new market segment. You know, they, they're not directly competing against these big, almost luxurious airlines. They created their new market. So reduce to dominate. This is not as extreme as to get rid of the unnecessary, but it's similar. You know, find what's in the market you think has to be present, but shouldn't have as much attention as before. You can't be perfect at anything. So there's always going to be a compromise. And by deciding to reduce something. Everything, not any, you said anything. Yeah, sorry, sorry. You can't be perfect. <laughs> I was talking to you. <laughs> uh, you can't be perfect at everything. So you have to compromise and that compromise is going to come from sacrificing other things. So by deciding to compromise in some features, then you can dominate in others, right? Uh, raise the undervalued. This is where you really show like your differentiation, right? So excel at what current industry standards are undervaluing. What aren't people doing? What are they doing but not as good? And since you've compromised in other areas, then you can boost these. And then finally, one of the most important is innovating. 
back to what I said with the value innovation, you have to think about new features and new ways that you could offer value that others in the industry haven't before, right? So this is, consider what no one else is doing. And this is kind of like the main point of the Blue Ocean strategy. You have to go ahead and redraw these industry boundaries and think, what can I do that they can't? Or what can I do differently? So this example is, is heavily covered in the book and I think is perfect to really get what I'm, I'm trying to talk to you about. Cirque du Soleil. So Cirque du Soleil achieved a extremely rapid growth in a stagnating industry. The circus industry is decades, decades old, but hadn't really seen too much growth. They were always there, but what? The, the user base was highly competitive. All these big circ uh, circus companies competing for the same amount of uh, types of users, people who like circus, some people don't, some people do. And they were able to create this completely new experience, this uncontested market where competition was made irrelevant. You could want to go to Circus de Soleil, but that could be somebody who liked the circus, but also could be somebody who liked theater, who liked music, who liked live shows. It's a completely different targeted audience, right? And through that, they didn't have to insp uh, like spend massive amounts of money competing directly against these other circuses. So they saved all that time. And they combined like, the f best of a circus and a theater while eliminating everything else, right? They don't have animal shows. They don't have huge, like, daring uh, sh things with, like, chainsaws and everything. They removed all of that, and then they focused it on the things that mattered. So... What did they eliminate? They didn't have star performers. They didn't have like named people. They didn't have animal shows like I mentioned. Uh, concession sales completely disappeared. You didn't have people selling popcorn. You know, that's a benefit that the circus industry had and they just completely eliminated. They didn't have multiple show arenas. It was one production that you went to. What did they reduce? So they had no fun and humor. It was a serious production and it had no real thrill and danger. There were some, obviously in Circus Slade, there are stunts involved, but the traditional thrill that you would have from a circus of, oh, will they die, will they get hurt, is pretty much gone. So what did they raise? So they focused heavily on unique venues. If you compared a, a traditional circus venue, which is practically uniform. You have the traditional colors, it gives that certain vibe, and then you go to Cirque du Soleil, you realize this is not a circus, right? They spent so much time, and since they were able to cut down on these star performers, animal like shows and all this, they were able to invest all those that time and resources into the venues. And then what did they create? They created themes, they created refined environments, they, they had multiple productions, so it was almost like a story, like a, almost like a theater. They involved artistic music and dance. And with these, you know, in this way, they were able to carve out a brand new market. And this is a very useful diagram that it shows in the book a lot. And I think Oliver had mentioned it in the past where you have the traditional kind of circuses, right? So price, relatively high, but what are they competing on? So they're competing on star performers, animal shows, aisle concessions, and multiple show arenas. They have fun and humor and throws in danger. You have the best circuses, the ones at the top of their field on, in this red ocean, and it's the Ringling Brothers. You know, they've been here forever, they know how to do it, and they're heavily competing against these smaller regional circuses. So these are in the red ocean. They might have a small competitive advantage, but they're mostly competing due to price. They're priced a little bit lower and therefore they deliver a little less value. But as you can see, they're trying to exactly copy what Ringley Brothers does. But then you have Cirque du Soleil. They do, of course, have an extremely high price, but they make up to, for it because by completely eliminate, eliminating these factors and heavily reducing these others, they were able to raise more than others Unique venues, Ringling Brothers didn't really pay attention to that, and then create new paradigms where their competitors just weren't in there before. And then, like I mentioned, that included the themes, the refining, a re like refined viewing environment. And in this way, they were able to redefine what a circus is and achieve amazing growth in an industry that really was stagnating for a lot of time. So it's always important to go through these. Um, these four kind of paths and consider yourself, you know, look at your competition and see how can, what can you do differently? You know, what, how can you innovate? How can you, instead of operating in a red ocean, which is completely understandable, a lot of companies do, how can you make that a blue ocean instead? Because in a blue ocean is when you're really gonna see that high growth and that's really when you're gonna see those really successful companies. So, um, 
not to pretty much. Thank you.